Hello, and welcome to Office Hours, our monthly discussion for Eloqua professionals. I'm Richard Holder, the head of marketing here at Forthought Marketing, and I'll be your host today. Today's presentation will be pre recorded, and a link will be available within one business day and it will be sent to you via email. We really encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A feature so that we can make sure that we answer your questions. And of course, you're free to answer, to ask questions about today's session or suggest topics for future sessions. Joining me today is Dharam Singh, a marketing operations specialist here at Forthought Marketing, who will, dis who will discuss dynamic content in Eloqua, and Mark Lavelle, our uh, esteemed CEO, and he will discuss uh, sales-influenced nurturing. So with that brief introduction, let me turn the time over to Duram. Go ahead. Thank you, Richard, for uh, the introduction. So today I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak on utilizing dynamic content to enhance personalization. So good morning, everyone. And I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to speak with you today. And so I'm going to talk about importance of personalization in today's digital landscape. What is a dynamic content? Dynamic content personalization scenarios. What will be the outcome of using dynamic content for personalization? And the checklist I recommend for implementing the dynamic content. So let's start with uh, importance of personalization in today's digital landscape. We all know that personalization has become a key driving force for success across various industries. It involves tailoring content, services, and experience so that they can meet the unique needs, preferences, and behavior of the individual users. And studies shows us that the personalized email are more likely to be open than the generic one. So we can add personalization with field merge, dynamic content, dynamic web pages, but today I'm only going to focus mainly on the dynamic content. So the key characteristics of dynamic content is its ability to be personalized and customized dynamically so that it can provide a tailored experience for each individual user. This contracts with uh, static content, which remains same for all users and doesn't change based on the user specific variables. Here in the image, you can see how the cloud uh, app name and the documentation link is inserted as a dynamic content along with the field merge use. So for any person who is submitting a cloud app pre-trial request, so we personalize their journey by providing them the correct documentation link for the uh, installing and configuration of their application. So what is a dynamic content? Dynamic content refers to digital content that can change and adapt based on various factors such as behavior of a customer, their preferences, their uh, real-time preferences. For me, dynamic content is a secret source to personalization. So there can be many examples. For example, a marketing agency sends out a monthly newsletter using dynamic content each subscriber can receive a version tailored to their interests. So if you like to look at this picture, you can see that the images are different. You can have different text along in a single email with the different dynamic content criteria. Even you can customize the CTA so that uh, it can help uh, the customer to uh, directly land to the same page. So now I'm going to talk about three different scenarios, how uh, you can utilize dynamic content to make it more personalized in the email marketing. So my first scenario is you can personalize your email with content relevant to a contact on the basis of their content preferences. So if here, if you look at, there are two versions of email with different content, which are dynamically inserted to make the email more personalized as per the customer preferences. Not only it helps to avoid the clutter of sharing irrelevant information, 
which a customer might not want to see. It also helps them to get a better experience while sh sharing the correct information at the right time. Second scenario is a bank which is operating across multiple provinces in the United States and they utilize dynamic content in an email communication to connect the customers with appropriate account representative based on their geographic location. So you can see in the uh, image that they are leveraging uh, dynamic content criteria in the CTA also in their uh, dynamic signatures in the email communication. So this is an, another image showing uh, a person who is uh, in the different location. And if you look at the, at the signature that the sign uh, name is different and the account representative specifically belong to that geographic location. So what bank is doing, the bank is effectively connecting the customers with the right account representative based on their geographic location. Not only it helps them to streamline the consultation process, it also makes the customer feel valued. And instead of creating 50 emails uh, for 50 different regions, they created 50 dynamic content criteria and inserted them in a single email. So that's how they not only able to save the file management time, also they were able to save a lot of us in asset building. The scenario third is personalizing your email with images relevant to an account and peak interest for the recipient who are working in that company. So here you can see that there are three different uh, banner images and different texts. So in this uh, email, a hyperlink image to a company and email for the furniture resale. So if a contact is linked to a company that is specialized in a particular type of furniture, then the unique image will link to the section of the email uh, featuring that the type of furniture and it will help to personalize the experience avoiding any uh, information which is irrelevant to them. So what are the outcomes of using dynamic content for personalization versus enhanced user experience? So if you have seen uh, in, the, in the context of email personalization in our three scenarios, dynamic content ensures that the, every interaction is uniquely tailored, making communication feel personal and directly relevant to each recipient interest. For geographic tailoring, uh, it connects customer with local representative, adding a layer of personalized service. In industry specific engagement, Delivering content that resonate with the recipient fields create more meaningful and it help also helps in engaging the user experience. Then second point is uh, increased engagement. So by catering to the specific interest of your audience through personalized emails, engagement is enhanced as recipient find the content more relevant and engaging. It also ensures that the communication are not just seen but acted upon as they feel more directly uh, relevant with the hyperlinks and the images related to the recipient choice. It significantly uh, in, like increase the interest and drive further interaction. The next point is higher conversion rate. So by tailoring the email content on the recipient per, uh, preferences, it is more likely uh, that the most relevant information is present to them and the calls to action. So it makes easier for them to connect uh, with, the, uh, with the resources and uh, it helps them to make a quicker decision. So dynamic contents leverage personal interest to encourage action that leads to conversion. The next point is customer retention and loyalty. So whenever there will be personalized email campaigns, so it will definitely going to foster a deeper connection with the recipient and also encouraging them uh, to repeat business by making every interaction feel valued and unique. The next point will be data-driven decision-making. So the use of uh, dynamic content in email personalization, geographic tailoring, or in any industry-specific engagement, will provide a valuable real-time feedback and analytics. 
and this data will help uh, the marketers to design uh, strategic decisions which will helping them to ensure that the content re remain relevant and impactful also the marketing uh, strategies can be aligned with the audience preferences and behaviors and the last point will be optimize marketing efforts so dynamic content always allows you to have a continuous improvement of marketing effort through data driven insight ensuring that each of the email campaign is more targeted and effective also uh, these insights help you to further refine the relevance and impact of each communication maximizing the uh, marketing roi so if you look all these uh, points are interrelated with each other now the checklist which will be required for Im implementing a dynamic content so the first uh, point uh, which i suggest is uh, to make sure that you have a default criteria rule for example imagine a recipient sees nothing as they do not meet any criteria so make sure that you have a generic default version of email for them under the default criteria in the dynamic content second is content style and fonts so if in case if there is any difference in the content style and the font of the dynamic content and it is not resonating well with the email it may end up with the rendering issues which no one want to experience after launching their campaigns to avoid that third will be data accuracy so whenever you are uh, creating dy dynamic content make sure that you are keeping them updated and relevant as per the customer needs and the last point will be live testing so live testing always help you to mitigate any correction required in a dynamic content before it is getting live and also make sure that all the criteria you have created are working so in short i talk about the importance of personalization what is a dynamic content what are the use case scenarios of dynamic content what can be the outcome and the checklist required so my, in my conclusion dynamic content offers you to enhance personalization enabling tailored experience that can be uh, that can resonate with the individual preferences and behavior so by leveraging this business can foster deeper connection and get success in today's competitive landscape Thank, Thank you, you. Jerome. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, let me check our uh, questions here and see if we have any for you. Ah, yes. So we have one question. Um, the question here is uh, basically, can the criteria have multiple attributes or select multiple products for a single rule? Yes, uh, we can have that. Uh, so just like segments, you cre you create as many filters as you want in the dynamic content as well. You can create as many criteria as you want. So suppose, for example, a person can be interested in multiple services or product. So you can create different criteria uh, in a dynamic content tool for that. Excellent. Um, that is the only question we received today. I appreciate your time, Jaram, today. So let's move on to the next topic and give the floor to Mark. I'm going to let him take over the screen. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon or morning to whichever it is for you uh, out there. My name is Mark Lavelle. I'm the CEO of Forethought Marketing, and today we'll be talking about nurturing while selling. Um, can everybody see my screen? Can anybody see my screen? Richard, anybody? Yep, you can. Fantastic. So today we're going to talk a um, little bit about how a little bit about how you can help reps while you engage in the sell while they're engaging in the selling process. Now, those of you that have engaged with Forethought Market in, in the past may know from a strategic perspective that we look at the funnel from a bunch of different perspectives. The most common perspective that everybody knows is the state perspective, sometimes the audience perspective. Um, but there are a lot of different perspectives possible. And today we're going to be focusing on the functions, the organizations, and the, depart the departments and the systems perspective. 
The thing is, is all of these different perspectives on the funnel are valid in the same way that you can look at a human being and think you see them. But in fact, there are all sorts of different systems going on within a human being. There's a like skeletal system, there's the cardiovascular system, there's the nervous system, the digestive system, and so forth. The same thing is true of the funnel. And today we're going to focus on the functions that pass through the funnel, or that, go, that, that, that are controlled in the funnel, the departments and the systems. So let's start off and talk about what is happening from a functional perspective as we go through the funnel when nurturing while selling. Well, we're all familiar with um, the basic functions of marketing automation, those things that happen at the beginning of the process. And we're also all pretty familiar as well with um, what happens after the sales process. Those well-implemented marketing automation systems will also have onboarding um, processes, cross-sell and upsell processes that occur after the fact. But for many organizations, nurturing while selling the middle portions of the funnel is a relatively untapped opportunity. And there's some good reasons for that, some good political reasons, but those reasons can be overcome. Now, the first thing we want to talk about is what is happening during the sales process? And there's a number of things happening, and this is a simplification. But in general, sales qualification is what's happening at the early stage of the funnel, and opportunity management is happening a little later on in the sales uh, funnel. So the question we have to ask and answer um, when considering nurturing while selling is, how do we take those functions, and how do we support them from a nurturing marketing automation perspective? So from a qualification perspective, we want to consider the qualification criteria, send emails that may help resolve that, use page tagging to help resolve that, try and understand the size and title. And the one that I see most often is product determination. If you're in the early stages of the funnel, the sales rep hasn't picked up the lead yet, hasn't gotten through to the lead yet, or maybe just had some very early qualification conversations, helping understand product can be huge. Later in the funnel, from an opportunity management perspective, something that's very important here is to remember, this is the evaluation stage of the funnel, okay? You are looking at things later stage here. You want to put out cri uh, comparison criteria. There's a bunch of reasons why we want to be really careful here. We'll connect with that in a second. But what you don't want to do is send out a bunch of top of funnel early stage content because that will throw the deal off it will it will it'll make the customer feel like you don't understand where i am from a sales perspective you are spamming me in addition it's very helpful to get social proof and testimonials this is probably the safest thing to send when nurturing while selling so this is what is happening the the two things that are happening during nurturing while selling but what about who now who is pretty simple if we take the functions we were just talking about and sort of move them down here to the bottom, we can see, and I think we all know, that we've got SDRs, and some companies will call them telesales, even telemarketing inside sales that are often at the early stage. You often have inside sales or field sales at the latter stage. And again, there's every mix and possible combination. You may not have this. You may just, you may not have this. You know, every possible way of selling exists out there in the world. Try to map what I'm saying to the concepts that are going on here, not necessarily the absolute terminology, because every company has different terms and different combinations. So the question again comes up, if we're going to help who we're trying to sell, okay, how can we assist these particular roles while we're selling? And so really from an early stage perspective, when we're talking about a sales development rep or a telesales um, these guys usually have the longest process going on. They're trying over and over again to get a hold of somebody they haven't connected. They're trying to connect. So you've got a long process, often unsuccessful, often SDRs, all reps in fact, but often SDRs give up too easily, which is why nurturing while, while selling may make a lot of sense. And SDRs are least, least likely to have the political concerns because they have this huge stack of these uh, leads, and they're only able to get through a small percentage of them. And if you're also emailing them while selling and sending communications, that helps. Now, as we get farther down the process by role, we end up with a, sort of a different perspective. Now, inside sales, if you have it for small deals, this is typically a pretty short process. Again, some companies don't have that process. They're usually handling larger quantities of deals. It usually happens pretty fast. So they don't have as many political objections as you'll find with field sales. 
but it, they're still there. They're sort of in the middle ground between these two different groups. Now, sales reps um, who are handling large, complex deals. What I'm looking at here, defining here is field sales. Again, not necessarily the correct term, especially in today's post-COVID world, but the, 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 the folks that are handling large, often complex deals, these are definitely the most likely to object. And executives who have an experience, a history, uh, they used to be field sales reps or, or executive sales reps, they will often have um, objections of the same type because they don't want um, marketing hurting or ruining their deal. So when a sales rep objects, when this is going to happen, what do you do? And the thing is, Sales reps will and should object if their de if their deals might be der derailed by a poorly timed email. The answer here is control. And so the question is, how can you empower your sales department with control? How can you not only enable nurturing while selling, but how can you make it so that your salespeople have the personal control to um, handle what's going on here and nurture when it's appropriate, not nurture when it's not appropriate. And there are several answers to this. So let's take a look at the options that we can give sales reps. Now, there's a couple of basic options, which arguably um, you know, aren't really options. They're kind of what is just happens. Number one, you can just always nurture. Well, that's not giving this guy any control. That's just saying, hey, you're out there selling. We're going to be out there nurturing. We're going to send it to them. You know, hopefully it works out for you. Then there's the option to never nurture. This is what most comp companies are doing today. In many ways, that's just as bad. That's also been giving this guy no ability to, emp to empower him with nurturing capability. So how do we give this guy the capability? Well, there's really three different options here. And there, two of them are pretty similar. And that is to enable the salesperson to control the process of nurturing him or herself. Now, the most basic control here is an on-off control. Okay, this is where you basically enable a salesperson to stop the nurturing or start the nurturing. That's it. Now, in this case, marketing will control what nurturing occurs. If the sales reps don't care, they're not going to bother, they don't, they, they're not interested in engaging with the details of nurturing, that may be the best option. It is one of three. The second one's very similar. We just add the pause capability. This is slightly better than on off because your sales rep again can then can say, okay, I want to pause this because I'm talking to this guy. Maybe I'll turn it on again later. Maybe I won't. And then he talks to the guy for a week. He talks to the guy for another week. And then guess what? All of a sudden, the guy starts to ghost him. A week goes by. Another week goes by. This poor guy is, 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 is frustrated and, and concerned. And he goes, you know what? I'm going to turn on that nurturing because they can send some emails that I can't. Maybe, the, maybe that nurturing will bring this guy back. And he, he unpauses. The third option <clears throat> is enabling the sales reps to personally, directly set whatever nurture campaign they want to select from a pull-down list. Now, this is the most powerful if they use it. And that's the that's the that's the, the sort of the disadvantages. Some sales reps will really glom onto this. They'll love it. Uh, typically 20, 30 percent will go, oh, this is great. This is really powerful. But a lot of reps will kind of ignore it, not utilize it. And that's where um, option D starts to come in. Now, where option D is really valuable is to say is, is when you're talking with a vice president of sales or an executive. And to say to that executive, hey, I understand your concern that we might hurt one of your reps deals. How about this? How about if we only nurture if your reps haven't had any activity, any contact with the customer for a month or two weeks or some number of days? And every sales rep will tell you what that is. I've had sales reps go, Oh no, two weeks is way long. If my sales reps haven't contacted them in three days, I want you in there. Great, fantastic. Others are like, yeah, seven, 10 days, that's about right. Now this is the hardest to implement, but it is politically most palatable. What VP of sales will not want you to nurture if in the sales CRM system, there's no contact happening. The sales rep's not doing his job. Maybe it's only um, um, from a paperwork perspective, but doesn't matter if he's not doing his job, that nurturing is going to kick on and that's automatically going to help the salesperson because he's not able to connect. It's not happening. And the funny thing is the reason he's not able to connect, it might be because the person's not responding on the other end, but we have to remember 
Salespeople take vacations. It gets to be the end of the quarter. They get busy at the end of the quarter. They don't have time to focus on anything except the deals that they're closing. Sometimes for two, three, four, five weeks, if they take a vacation after the quarter ends. Um, this is where automatic uh, nurturing after a certain number of days is beautiful. And of course, there's combinations of these. What companies will often do is implement these things in phases. They'll, for example, say, okay, we're going to do this in phase one. If there's no, no, and then we're going to implement campaign selection in phase two. Or, they're, or they'll reverse those. They'll say this is going to be phase one and this is going to be phase two. Now, the question comes up at this point is, okay, how do you do this? How do you actually make this function? Um, and from that perspective, first of all, we have to look at the systems that we're actually going to be utilizing here. And I think we all know what those are. There's your marketing automation system and there's your customer relationship management, your CRM system, often Salesforce or one of the sales tools out there. And so on top of this, we have several databases. And I think most of us probably know the databases that exist again. And there's more databases than this, of course, in these systems. So how do you integrate when you've gotten and make this nurturing wall selling control work when you've got an Eloqua contact the table, you've got a salesforce.com contact table and so forth? Well, the answer is pretty, pretty straightforward, again, conceptually. Um, and that is that you've got your sales reps and you empower them to update a lead screen, a field on a lead screen that lets them pick a nurture campaign or turn a nurture campaign on or off. You allow the sales reps to, to control a field on the contact screen that allows them to have a pull down and that pull down gives them a list. And then what happens is those fields both funnel back over into the contact table of Eloqua. And presto, you control your marketing automation program from that Eloqua contact table. Whatever's set in that field, that's the marketing automation, um, that's the um, nurture um, track that that particular contact is on. So to summarize, because we're almost out of time here, first thing to consider is how you're going to help. Typically, you'll help in one, two, or three ways. Are you going to help qualify? Are you going to help the customer with the evaluation process? Are you help helping sales catch dropped balls? When broaching this up front, consider the politics. Most important, you will just get tossed out on your ear if sales feels you are going to mess up their deal, okay? So work with sales and execs. Let them know fully and completely convince them that you're only going to do what's going to help. And you're going to do that by enabling rep control. You're going to let the rep stop, start, stop, and control the nurturing process. And you're going, to, you're going to potentially only nurture when sales has no activity after a given period of time. And that is our presentation. Do we have any questions, Richard? Yes, Mark. Thank you for that great presentation. Let me uh, open up the questions here. Um, so the first one is, um, this looks great, but how do I get vice president buy-in? Because that's the tough part. Well, it's it's not a trivial undertaking. You want to go in with um, your answers well prepared. Um, the biggest answer is what I think was answer a C a D on the list, and that is tell the VP, look, we won't do a thing unless your reps don't reach out and talk to um, the contact for some given period of time. And usually VPs of sales are pretty excited about that. If the VP of sales has a decent amount of objectivity about how his own sales team performs, he probably knows darn well that there are probably reps who don't follow up as often as they should or as much as they should. There are times of the quarter or um, periods of time when the reps don't follow up. And so saying you are only going to jump in when there's no activity from the reps that usually is pretty easy to get across. If you secondarily, as I said, give the reps control and say to the VP of sales, hey, um, if the reps don't like it, they can turn it off. They can pick a different program. They can shut it down. It's two clicks. Those two combined or even separate are usually enough. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, so the next question is, is I have some reps who are successful using a control like this, but others are not interested. How do I get them to begin using it? 
Um, not again, not an easy question. Um, there, you know, I, I won't pretend that you're ever going to convince all the reps. I've been um, head of sales uh, more than once in my career, and there's some who uh, you just can't. You can bring them to the water, but you can't make them drink. However, um, if you can find and show that the reps who are doing this are more successful, either through a statistical approach, hey, look, our, you know, our top three reps are all using nurturing while selling, or a narrative approach. Um, the narrative approach is, um, hey, look, so-and-so had this and this happened and they turned on nurturing while selling and that brought the customer back after they'd been ghosted. Um, those One of those two approaches will get more reps, not necessarily all of them. Great. Thank you. And I have one final question is, is there ever a case where it's uh, you're not getting alignment with the sales leadership? but you're getting interest from the rank and file salespeople. Does that ever happen? Um, yes. And all I can really help with or say there is um, go back to those narratives, try and bring the VP or executive on the sales side around. Um, but sales execs typically have more authority and more control more power to put it bluntly than the marketing execs do, or than especially a marketing ops exec does. And if you don't convince them, you don't convince them. And some are not convincible. Um, but um, use those narratives and the ones I already gave you. Um, your sales reps will have control. We'll only do it when they're not uh, successful or not having any contact. Um, why wouldn't you, if, if the reps aren't able to contact, why wouldn't you want to fill that gap? Um, I mean, if the sales reps are sending lots of emails with lots of nicely attached literature about, about the product the customer was interested in when they were in MQL, great. But if not, you know, nurturing while selling is pretty valuable. Great. Thank you, Mark. Well, that that's the last of the questions for today.